Hello, welcome to Breaking It All Down, I'm Count Zero. Well, this week I'm taking a look at another classic science fiction novel with the first installment of the Cities in Flight series by James Blish, They Shall Have Stars. Now this is going to be a short review because, well, the book is short. Very, very short. Like, oh, not, it's under 200 pages. And these aren't big pages. This isn't small font. Practically a novella, to a certain degree. Um, this also isn't the first book in, those, in the series that was written. So, when I'm reviewing this, I'm kind of having to keep that in mind, that basically, a lot of the world has actually already been fleshed out before this, in terms of what the audiences would have been reading, and that sort of thing. So, I'm not going to go too in-depth on this, also, because it's a short book, it's a plot-light book. It basically is a lot of explaining. It's world building, it's background building, all that fun stuff. So, the book essentially has two main plots, maybe two and a half. Um, both are pretty much the same way, as far as how they're structured. Plot A involves the development of an anti-agathic, or anti-aging drug, on Earth. And basically goes into, well, what's goes into making drugs and that sort of thing with this one character a spaceman on earth on leave basically doing a little investigating to find out what's going on and he gets a lot of splaining dumped on him same general thing with the B plot which involves a bridge being built through the atmosphere of Jupiter this bridge is ultimately being built for development of anti-gravity technology because they want to doing some experiments with that sort of stuff with this and other than that the other major plot here isn't so much a plot as much as a little undercurrent in the background of the internal tensions within the US government about wasted money resources and that sort of thing and having to keep up with the Soviets Cause yeah this book was written in the 1950s and so the Soviets are still a thing. The Cold War is still a thing, which I'm gonna be absolutely blunt on this. Science fiction is a genre that is generally known for its futurism and for its foresight and that sort of thing in various geopolitical fashions. I mean, a great example of this is in H.G. Wells' *The Shape of Things to Come*, or I believe that's the title of it, where Wells talks about basically. He, some, he semi predicts the fall of the various imperial state states in terms of all the empires dis disintegrating into their own little countries, like Great Britain and France and that sort of thing, as well as both World War One and Two, and even a little bit of the technology that gets involved. He almost predicts the bomb, but yet in this and a lot of science fiction that was written around the Cold War, well, I'm not expecting them to predict, oh, communism will fall, that sort of thing. But a lot of it tends to stick with the idea that the U.S. and the Soviet Union will always be politically tense with each other. They will always be at loggerheads. And that while communism and democracy will still continue, this will, we will also have this inherent clash and that the Cold War will always happen even if we're a hundred or two hundred years after the book in question has been written. And I, that always bugs me. Is at no point do these science fiction writers go, well maybe communism and democracy and capitalism as far as countries with these differing philosophies can kind of coexist. That idea never really comes up. And from my 21st century, the Soviet Union has fallen, and we are at very go on decent terms with China, and possibly even eventually warming up with Cuba. This just seems odd to me. 
Anyway, the anti-aging drug is invented. The anti-gravity drive, which is known as the spin dizzy, is invented without needing the bridge. Making that whole plot thread thing disappointing and unnecessary. And thus, a new generation of humans goes out into the stars, basically almost immortal, and are able to explore space free of the ravages of time and the dual oppressions of the United States and the Soviet Union from Earth. The book's okay. All right, get the verdict really quick. The book is okay. It's decent. It's not great. I mean, it, it's, it's it's not stellar. It's not what I would expect from a Hugo Award-winning writer in terms of just on its own little thing, but it's all right. Honestly, if I'd known that there was an omnibus of this series, I might have gone with the omnibus first, just because I think the series would work better as a co cohesive whole. I mean, I want to read the rest of the books in the series, and I will do reviews of them a chunk at a time as we proceed through the whole Cities in Flight quadrilogy, for lack of a better term. But I would say, if you're going to pick this up, go for the Omnibus instead of, like, say, if you find a copy of Volume 1 at a used bookstore, pick up the, um, pick up the Omnibus instead of just Volume 1. You'll get more bang for your buck, and I think it would flow better into a more cohesive, interesting whole than just kind of a chunk at the time. Chunk at the time. And with that really short bit done, um, I got a lot of time left, so let's talk about the Hugo some more. So, last week I took a look at the nominees for Best Novel. This week I'm going to adjust, instead of going to the novella and short story and that sort of stuff, because the Hugo packet isn't up yet, which means a lot of stuff isn't online yet, I'm going to look at the nominees for the visual categories. I'll ha now, I haven't watched all of these yet, and to give a disclaimer, I intend to watch as many of these as I can, but I haven't watched all of them yet. So, we're starting off right back with the short form stuff. Doctor Who basically owns this category. Of the five nominees, three of them are episodes of Doctor Who. That's not too surprising, considering that basically the majority of science fiction television right now is Doctor Who, markedly good science fiction television, so I'm not surprised, I'm not disappointed, I'm not upset. So, it makes sense. I haven't watched these shows yet, as far as these episodes, because it's from the last season, and Netflix Instant doesn't have that stuff up yet. But I'm planning plan to watch those, and if Doctor Who wins, and it probably will win, considering the probably the statistical odds of things, I won't be surprised, and I'll be kind of glad. The other nominees are an episode of Community. Again, I haven't seen Community isn't on Netflix Instant, and I don't think this episode is on Hulu anymore, as far as for free viewership kind of thing. But I mean, Community has been getting into more genre-related stuff, like science, fi like science fiction stuff with this episode, and with the Dungeons and Dragons episode not that long ago. I'm not giving the episode of these, of the community episode, because oftentimes the title of the episode doesn't necessarily have anything to do with the content. And again, I haven't watched the three specific Doctor Who episodes, so not to worry about it. The third nominee is a acceptance speech for the Hugo Awards from last year. And this is where I kind of get a little disappointed and get a little annoyed. I'm all for, like, internet video stuff getting nominated for Hugo Awards. There is plenty of internet video content, which I wouldn't mind seeing getting nominated. In particular, actually, um, considering some of the interesting storyline stuff that Linkara has been doing in his videos, if, say, Linkara were to get nominated for a Hugo Award, I would not be upset. In fact, it would make a little make me a little happy inside. And just saying. But on the other hand, though, giving an award for winning an award feels not just like a little too meta. It also feels a little too 
for lack of a better term, incestuous. I mean, it's not like you're giving an award to somebody's acceptance speech for somebody for a different award. Like somebody's, oh, there, there's the Web Critic Awards. If somebody did a very science fiction-y interesting accepted speech for that, and you gave them a nomination for that, I actually wouldn't feel so bad about it. Because you're not giving someone a Hugo for winning a Hugo. It's excessive. It's unnecessary. If that, if, if the acceptance speech wins, I, I might actually get a little mad about that. Just like all the other good stuff that's in this category. This leads me to the best long-form presentation, and this, this is an embarrassment of, of riches. We have, there's two fantasy works on here, but honestly, here I don't mind about the fantasy as much as in the best novel category. There is no n category at the World Fantasy Awards for best fantasy film, or best fantasy television series, or any sort of visual dramatic presentation. There just isn't any. Um, honestly, to be fair, there's kind of a good reason for that, because there's not that much fantasy television that's on right now. Not in the United States, but even if you start getting into Japanese animation, we don't get that much sort of more fantasy stuff there. We're getting some of it in the urban fantasy genre, but it's not as much as, like, say, sci-fi or just slice of life anymore. So that said, the two fantasy works we get are Harry Potter and the Deathly Hallows Part 2, and A Game of Thrones Season 1. Harry Potter, it's Harry Potter. I'm, I am not surprised that Harry Potter got nominated. And if it wins, hey, it's kind of, I mean, the Potter series has been doing fairly well in the theaters, and its last two installments have been well executed. Um, the other nomination is uh, again, Game of Thrones Season 1. I'm actually kind of particularly glad about this one, because it says, oh, we can have a award, basically, for an entire season of a show get nominated for season one or something like that. Here it back. And this is a real benefit for serialized television series. Stuff which is very heavy on the story arcs, not very episodic, not very standalone episodes, that sort of thing. I don't just mean this like in the, oh, Babylon 5, a bunch of seemingly semi-episodic episodes leading into one big arc kind of sense. In particular, like, when you get to stuff like most Japanese animation series, animated series, each episode, as a general rule, forwards a bigger arc and is like a chapter of a bigger arc. It's, to put it another way, a lot, of West, a lot of Western television series, even science fiction series, are like collections of short stories, where you will have story development for one character or another, um, and it'll be a little plot forwarding of an overarching meta plot if there is one, but generally, it's self-contained. Once you get to the end of the episode, most of the loose ends are tied up, if not all, and then the next week we can move on to the next story arc. Most Japanese animated series, they really are chapters of a bigger book. Um, with Game of Thrones as well, for its nomination, this fits perfectly in with this, because the Game of Thrones is the adaptation of the first book of the series, and each episode makes up a chapter of the larger book. Um, not literally one chapter, but you know what I mean. The other nominations were Hugo, which was, which is also... Well, the first Hugo nomination for um, Martin Scorsese. I checked. Shutter Island didn't get nominated. Um, and sadly, the book is. The, the film is no relation to Hugo Gernsback in any way, shape, or form. But anyway. Also, there's Source Code, which I've been meaning to see. I've heard very good things about it. And Captain America the First Avenger, which I just recently got from a blockbuster that was going out of business. So I will watch this at some point in the future and give my thoughts on that. It's a Blu-ray, so I can't do a nice little video review thing with clips of the film, but I will give my impressions on it later. All these movies are on my to-watch list. All of them seem like really strong contenders. 
And this could be a close race for this category, I think. As an aside, speaking of Hugo Gernsbach, I'd love to see somebody do a docudrama about Hugo Gernsbach or Forrest J. Ackerman or that sort of thing. Just because that'd just be an interesting thing to see that. There, I think those are people who are underappreciated in popular culture, where people in general don't don't really get Gernsbach and Ackerman the way we science fiction and fantasy and horror fans get them. And that's basically it for this week's episode. Next week, I'm taking a, a look at another video game. Um, this one's going to be pretty different from most of the other stuff I've reviewed. It's also going to be another story light game, so... Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm looking at Rayman Origins. And since that's story light, I'll probably have enough time after that to take a look at the Hugo nominees for the new category of Best Fan Cast. Something which... I've actually been able to listen to most of the shows in this category, so I'll be able to actually give a pick for who I want to win this time. Since I'm not a voter, but I didn't register for that. Anyway, until next time, thank you for watching.